Dr. Rand earned his Ph.D. from Harvard University in Systems Biology and his B.A. from Cornell University in Computational Biology. His work focuses on human cooperative behavior. His approach combines empirical observations from behavioral experiments with predictions generated by evolutionary game theoretic math models and computer simulations. By doing this, Dr. Ran asks what pro-social and antisocial decisions people will make in particular situations and social environments, the cognitive mechanisms that determine how these decisions are actually made, and the ultimate explanations for why our decision-making processes have come to function as they do. He draws on methodologies from psychology as well as economics and evolutionary biology, and is interested in applications including law, management, and public policy. Dr. Rand has published in high-impact journals including Nature and Science, was named Wired Magazine's Smart List uh, in 2012 as one of 50 young people who will change the world, and his work has widely appeared in the media including the BBC, NPR's Morning Edition Marketplace and All Things Considered, Scientific American, Huffington Post, uh, New York Times, LA Times, The Atlantic, The Washington Post, and MSNBC, among many others. Today I'll be speaking with Dr. David Rand from Yale University. Hi Dave, thanks for speaking with us today. Uh, my greatest pleasure. So Dave, um, I think what I'd love to hear from you is just a little bit about what first got you interested in the topic of emotion. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about what took you to that path um, and you know, what, what do you think really sparked your interest? So the way that I came to all of this uh, is maybe a little bit untraditional, which is that I, um, I kind of came out of experimental economics. Uh, and in econ, there's this huge focus on rationality as like the key and center of everything. Um, and I'm particularly interested in pro-social behavior, cooperation, altruism kind of stuff. And it was pretty clear to me that uh, rationality was not the only thing or even perhaps the main thing motivating a lot of decisions in that domain. So as I try and understand more and more how people actually make decisions in the context of helping each other, uh, it became clear that sort of uh, intuitive automatic processes were really important of which emotions are a big component. Excellent. So what's really neat about your work, and I would love to ask you some questions now about your research, is that it really, um, working on cooperation takes this really awesome interdisciplinary approach. I mean, you draw on methodologies from psychology, economics, and evolutionary biology, which is a really unique perspective. I don't think that anyone to date has really taken to look at the role of cooperation and, and how it relates to emotion. So in humans, you know, you found that our more quick-moving and intuitive instincts are to be cooperative, where our more slow-moving or reflective responses are actually to be more self-focused or selfish. And I wondered if you could tell us all just a little bit more about the studies that you've been doing in this vein. Yeah, so uh, we did a bunch of experiments using um, economic games. So these sort of things where you create uh, the key of sort of cooperation is situations where there's a tension between what's, what's best for the individual and what's best for the group as a whole. So using these economic games, you do things like everybody gets some money, they choose how much to keep for themselves and how much to contribute to the group, where all of the contributions get doubled and then split equally by everyone. So if everyone contributes, everyone's better off, but uh, you personally lose money on contributing. So the best thing for you would be everyone else contributes and you just free ride off of that. So we, they create this tension, and then we look at uh, you know what happens when people have to make, actually make their decisions. And what we find is what you were saying, that it seems like the f automatic sort of first response intuitive uh, decision is to contribute a lot. And then uh, the longer you think about it, uh, the more selfish you get. And so um, the, we have with correlational evidence, we have manipulation studies, you force people to respond quickly, they contribute more, you prime them to be more intuitive, they contribute more. Um, and I think the other thing that I want to say about it is that it's a little bit of a simplification to say that uh, we are intuitively cooperative um, in the following sense, is that what we find is basically that people's intuitions reflect the social world that they come from. Mm -hmm. So people that uh, experience like the world as a trustworthy place where their interaction partners are nice to them and stuff like that, their automatic uh, reaction is to be cooperative people that come from a nasty world, their automatic response is to be selfish. Uh, but then no matter where you start 
the more you think about it, the more selfish you get. So it's like deliberation undermines whatever your automatic sort of heuristic response is. So almost, yeah, in some ways, perhaps you should deliberate less when we think about cooperating with other people. Right, which is a weird thing to be saying because, you know, in general, I'm a big fan of deliberation, uh, <laughs> you know, um, and I don't really think that in general the world would be better off if everybody deliberated less. Uh, but that is the sort of, um, basically the result of what we find is that in these games you get better sort of social, sort of more socially beneficial behavior when people deliberate less. It's fascinating stuff. I mean, you've also done some work um, discovering that rewarding interactions are actually as effective in promoting group cooperation as punishment and that these positive or rewarding interactions may even lead to better outcomes. And so could you just tell us a little bit more about this because it's really fascinating and also one of these results that might be not what people exactly expect. Yeah, so the the backdrop for that work was that there's been in in terms of the literature on cooperation on the evolution of cooperation and stuff like that yeah. in the last maybe 10 or 15 years there's been this huge focus on basically the reason people cooperate with each other is that if they don't people will pay costs to punish others and so you should be a nice person or like a well behaved person because if not other people will like really make you suffer for it and like when i look around the world that i live in I don't really see like a lot of like spiteful or costly punishment where people are going out of their way to impose costs on other people as like a main motivating force of most of my social interaction. Uh, or do and, you? Just kidding. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but uh, and, and so what we were thinking is that um, you know when I think about what do I actually experience in life? It's not to say that people are just, you can do whatever you want and there's no consequences, but it's that the main like vehicle for uh, incentivizing good behavior, I feel like, is denial of future uh, reward. And it's, we're not talking about monetary rewards, but if you think about things like, um, okay, so the, the sort of, the, the little joke anecdote or, that I tell about this is, so if you think about uh, the sort of the cooperation problem being a bunch of housemates living together and like doing their dishes or not doing their dishes as the case may be uh, that if it's just you're doing dishes or you're not doing dishes as soon as one person stops doing their dishes everybody else is like well screw it I don't want to be the person that's still doing my dishes um, and so like what the main body of work in this field says that your solution should be is like when your housemate doesn't do her dishes, you should go into a room and smash her laptop with a baseball bat and then she'll do her dishes the next time. Yikes. And we're like, well, maybe not a great idea, but like what you can do instead that's that is this denial of future reward kind of thing is like next time say she comes and is like, hey, you know, like I need help with my this math problem. Can you like help me with that? Hey, can I borrow your computer or something like that? You're like Sorry, why don't you do your dishes, and then we'll talk about it. So there's still about, it's still incentives, but it's about rather than going out of your way to do something destructive to the other person, saying, look, I'm only willing to help you in the context of our pairwise relationship if you're being a good citizen at the group level. So that's nice in a way that it sort of motivates people to be better citizens, that they're more likely to get cooperation from others if they behave positively in a social right. context. Right, exactly. And so the way that you can explain a lot of group level cooperation is by remembering that the group interaction doesn't happen in a vacuum, but it happens superimposed on this network of personal uh, relationships. Excellent. So I want to ask you a little bit, I mean, what role do you think emotion can play here um, in thinking about some of the stuff you've just talked about? So I think that uh, a lot of what's going on with it, it, the sort of automatic, intuitive, cooperative response is presumably uh, driven by emotion and affect. Um, and so I think that uh, emotions are probably a good um, sort of proxy or tool for, for uh, communicating sort of general features of the situation you're in and sort of guiding your uh, a little bit more generalized responses rather than, you know, so if you think about this in like a dual process um, perspective of like these automatic sort of generalized, not very specific processes and then uh, that are fast. And then when you have your slow controlled reason think, you say, oh, well, in this exact situation, like what exactly should I be doing? So I would see probably a lot of emotions as 
uh, some of the somewhat more generalized agents. I mean, it's not that's not that is not to say that they're completely general, but that they respond to cues that aren't things that are like very deliberation oriented. Yeah, it'll be fun. I know you and I have had conversations thinking about the role that maybe positive emotions play versus negative emotions, and it seems like this is a wide open territory to try to look into. Definitely. So, Definitely. you know, and I'm thinking about this, this is one of the uh, other questions about your research is that, you know, this field of emotion and cooperation is really exciting. It's new and it's emerging. And as part of that, there's just a lot of unanswered questions, right? Um, and so, you know, as an expert in cooperation, I, I wonder what you think are the most promising candidates for emotion or related processes um, to emotion that we could try to really leverage to better understand cooperation. Yeah, so as you said, I think there's a ton mm -hmm. of candidates. Yeah. So the first thing that comes most obviously to mind is empathy. Um, that, you know, that it, if you, the more empathic you feel towards the other person, the more inclined you are going to be, uh, to be cooperative from just like a sort of, I don't know the right word, but like a very direct kind of basic thing. Okay, I'm empathic, I'll do it. Then things that seem like uh, maybe important for a little bit more second order things are emotions like pride, like, you know, you want to be a good person, you feel sort of proud. You know, when you help a stranger, then you feel, yeah, I really did the right thing. Like, that's good. You know, I feel good about that. Or shame, you know, as the, as the converse of that. Um, and then also when you get into the domain of um, the reward and punishment kind of stuff, so like, you know, provisioning incentives, it's trying to incentivize other people to be cooperative. Uh, presumably anger will be an important motivation there. And also disgust, I imagine something that could be quite important. Well, it'll be really exciting to see what some of these discoveries are, I'm sure, that you'll be spearheading in the years to come. Um, so when you think about some of these potential discoveries with emotion and cooperation, you know, I know that some people might wonder, well, is the role of emotion in cooperation something that is a human universal, kind of cross-culturally same everywhere? Or might there be some important sources of cross-cultural variation here? Yeah, so I think that's a, such a fascinating question and it's a direction that I'm really interested in exploring because um, I think that there's, there's good documentation of cross-cultural differences in behavior in terms of cooperation. And so I, what I think is, is really interesting to me is to what extent are those differences, differences because um, the sort of mechanisms for getting people to follow norms are the same and what varies across cultures are the norms. So it could be, you know, people feel proud when they follow the norm, they feel shame when they don't, or they get angered when other people don't. And it's well, basically when people don't behave appropriately or do behave appropriately. And then what varies across cultures is what's the definition of appropriate. Or could it be that there are actually deeper level uh, differences and that like doing appropriate behavior triggers different emotional responses in different places. And I don't think anybody knows, and I think it would be very interesting to find out. So when you think about the face of the future and think about emotion or emotion and cooperation, what do you see in store for the future? Well, I think like you were saying a little bit earlier, it's really like the Wild West that there, you know, there's like 10 million different awesome things to do. Uh, so what, I mean, the main thing that I see is lots of cool papers coming out trying to mm -hmm. actually uh, pin down specific relationships between particular emotions or particular combinations of emotions uh, and behavioral outputs in, in this context. Yeah. And so what advice would you have for students? A lot of them will be spearheading, you know, this wild west in the future. What advice <laughs> would you have for these students, you know, as they try to embark in studying some of these questions that relate to emotion? Um, yeah, okay, what advice? It's a good question. Uh, I think that one thing that it, I would say is particularly important, at least from my perspective, so I, I really like using economic games, and I think that like economics offers a lot of really good methodologies for studying these kinds of questions, and in particular, I think it could be really fruitful for people coming from psychology and from a sort of emotion perspective, uh, that you can use these approaches uh, like a methodologies from economics in combination with ways of thinking about things and approaches from psychology to get these really sort of productive synergistic interactions in a way that people that are just doing econ would never think to ask about emotions in this kind of way. And people that were just doing emotion research without using the econ wouldn't have these cool tools. Mm -hmm. So I think that this is really a fruitful place for integrating 
approaches. And what I would say in pursuit of that is if you're going to do it, people should really try and understand some behavioral economics. Um, and like, I think there's a lot of people using economic games without really understanding the way economists think about them. And it would be worth understanding that because there's some interesting stuff there. Well, thanks so much for speaking with us today. This concludes our Expert in Emotions series with Dr. David Rand from Yale University.